Crazy Facts About the Russian Army The A-40KT was one of the dead ends of war technology. Built in 1942, the Antonov A-40KT is one of the most original and mysterious Soviet weapon designs from the Second World War. In the 1930s, with the development of aviation and the emergence of parachute troops, there was a problem with providing adequate weapons to paratroopers dropped behind enemy lines. The basic armament of the airborne troops was too weak to provide the ability to fight against targets such as armored vehicles or more fortified resistance points. At that time, many countries began to look for a way to drop armored vehicles together with paratroopers. Oleg Antonov, the Soviet aircraft designer, was not the only one who came up with the idea of adding wings to the tanks. Projects of this type of weapon began to be created, among others, in Great Britain, the USA, and Japan. While the British and Americans ultimately decided that the best solution was to build powerful gliders capable of transporting single tanks, the Russians took a slightly different approach. In the late 1930s in the USSR, attempts were made to drop vehicles such as tankettes or armored cars from TB-3 or PE-8 bombers. The disadvantage of this solution was that the crews had to be dropped separately because if they were inside the vehicles, the overloads and forces acting when they touched on the ground could be fatal or, at best, very painful. Therefore, after landing, the soldiers each had to reach the vehicle on the ground before it was taken over by the enemy. In the end, the project was discontinued and the Soviet Army High Command commissioned Oleg Antonov to design a more proven glider that was to transport light tanks to the front. However, the constructor decided that the construction of the glider is not the optimal solution. Instead, he decided to develop a special rack with wings attached to the tank, allowing it to glide and land safely with the crew inside. In theory, the system had only advantages. The tank was to be delivered to the front line together with the crew, so they didn't need to waste any time getting to the vehicle, and the vehicle itself, after unhooking from the wings, could immediately go into action, much faster than unloading from the glider. A prototype of a flying tank named Antonov A-40 or A-40KT was completed in April 1942, and on August 7th or September 2nd, 1942, depending on the sources, the only flight of the machine took place. The wings were mounted on a lightened, stripped of armament and ammunition T-60 tank with a small reserve of fuel, which had to be lifted into the air by a TB-3 bomber. During takeoff, it turned out that the old TB-3 engines were too weak to raise the A-40 to the correct height. The whole thing was not able to rise higher than 40 meters, so the pilot decided to detach the glider much earlier to avoid a stall. According to one version of events, the tank piloted by Sergei Anokhin landed correctly. In the second version of events, the vehicle landed outside the planned landing site. Either way, it became clear that the technical obstacles exceeded the benefits of the tank's winged capability. In addition, the Russians had no opportunity to use such vehicles because they did not conduct large-scale amphibious operations. Also, the T-60 tank presented rather poor combat capabilities, especially in 1942. Thus, the project was abandoned. In 1957, the Ministry of Media Machine Building of the USSR issued a request for a nuclear power station on a mobile chassis, allowing for power generation in remote parts of the USSR. The vehicle received the name TESS-3, which stands for Transportable Electric Station 3, and was produced in the Leningrad-based Kirov factory. The first working station started producing energy in 1961. Its head designer, Joseph Coton, settled for an enlarged T-10 chassis with nine road wheels instead of the usual seven, due to the large size and weight of the power system, for chassis had to be linked. 
The Test 3 weighed 310 tons and was capable of transporting over 37 pounds of uranium. Its turbine generator produced 1.5 megawatts. However, in 1965, it was taken out of general service and the unprofitable project was ended in 1969. The Test 3 was sent to the Kamhatka Peninsula, where it served for several decades. The Soviet Union was one of the first countries to realize the unique potential of parachute forces. As early as 1927, there were reports of parachute troops being used against bandits in Central Asia. Within the next two to three years, Colonel Leonid Grigorovich Minov began to organize the first military parachute units. In a parallel development, General Mikhail Tuhachevsky, commander of the Leningrad Military District, began theorizing about and honestly exploring the plausibility of using airborne troops. Tuhachevsky was one of a group of far-sighted Soviet military officers who developed the concept of deep battle. This military concept seemed ready-made for the employment of parachute troops. Stalin's military purges of the late 1930s robbed the Red Army of its top leadership. The parachute force was especially hit hard and lost virtually all of its leadership down to about the rank of major. Included in the first round of purges was Tuhachevsky himself, who was executed on June 12, 1937. On June 22, 1941, Germany launched its invasion of the Soviet Union, codenamed Operation Barbarossa. More than 3 million German and Axis troops invaded the Soviet Union along a 2,900-kilometer long front. German forces initially moved quickly along the vast front, taking millions of Soviet soldiers as prisoners. By the end of August, German panzer divisions were just 350 kilometers from the Soviet capital. To highlight the sense of desperation, there have been stories recounting the fact that the Soviets dropped paratroopers into the snow without parachutes. This is in fact known to have happened on at least two occasions. The first was in Finland. The second was during the Viesma operation. In both cases, the planes were flying low and slow, and the drops were made into deep snow drifts. In the Viesma operation, there is even a mention that some of the paratroopers were wrapped in burlap sacks before they were dropped. Even data is given on the losses during the landing in such conditions, only 